Hello once again, I'm Kevin Turner from Real Estate Talk. Welcome once again to this special podcast on behalf of Australian Property Investor Magazine. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a very good friend of mine, a person I love talking to, Jane Slacksmith. Hi, Jane. Hey, Kevin. How are you going? Very well indeed. Thank you. Love to be talking again. And of course, Jane is the Director of Investor's Choice, the award-winning Investor's Choice. And congratulations to you. Chalking up lots of awards, Jane. Yeah, we've been working really hard. So many happy clients, which is great. Well, I want to talk to you about the GFC. I want to talk about finance and a few things around that. Uh, how, how are lenders' attitudes, um, how have they changed um, about in terms of deposit and so on for people wanting to get into a mortgage? It's a good question because I'm reading a lot of things in the media about concerns of the lenders laxing their standards. And, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that they've moved from, you know, 90% loan-to-value ratios to 95% loan-to-value ratios, and we're seeing more lenders doing that. And during the GFC, there was definitely a pullback, and in some expects, I guess, some lenders actually came back to saying, you know, we'll only go to 80% loan-to-value ratio with a principal and interest loan. So we did see a very conservative approach for a period there. But... You know, my experience, especially over the last couple of months, is although the lenders are advertising this 95% loan-to-value ratio, very few of those are getting through. And in actual fact, they're being so much more diligent than I've ever seen before. So to give you an idea, you know, we're, we're getting uh, calls from credit assessors saying that they are looking through the bank account statements for someone and in actual fact we had a client recently and there was a number of um, payments coming out every month for $90 and it wasn't something they declared on their fact finder and it wasn't something that was you know, noticeably obvious and the assessor said what is this monthly repayment and we went back to the female applicant and said do you know and she said no and then they have to ask my husband and she asked her husband and he'd been uh, paying off a diamond ring for her 40th birthday for the following year so you know <laughs> it, it wasn't anything really obvious but that's the, the amount of depth that they're going into. Do you think it's a dangerous sign for people? I mean, obviously, this is these are the banks trying to bait people, I guess, get the, to get the inquiry in. It, it shows about competition. But what sort of caution do you think you should be taking before you go into one of those 95% mortgages? Look, it's really, it comes down, and, it, and it's um, not just a 95% mortgage, it comes down to any investment decision, and that is buying the right property in the right place. I mean, you could buy the right property with an 80% loan, and it could go backwards just as likely as a property in the 95% lending space. So it really comes down to having the right property, because you don't want to get into a position of negative equity, which is when the property is actually worth less than the loan, and there's obviously a higher risk associated with that when it's a 95% loan and hence that's why the mortgage insurers you know, are going to charge you a lot more for their risk fee, that once off fee that they charge if you have less than a 20% deposit. Jane, what about um, single investors, single people who want to go into a mortgage, what, what challenges face them? I guess it's a, a, one of the kind of unspoken things that lenders look at when they look at any application is they look at it from two points of view. They look at it from the person. So they're looking at you as a risk and then they're looking at the asset as a risk. So we look at a single person as a risk. You know, obviously there's an issue that if you lose your income, then you may not be able to make the repayments. Now, in most cases, the reality is those people are also renting. So the alternative of renting or having a mortgage, if they lost their income, there could be a, an issue on either respect. But I think the thing is that for a single person who's actually taking on a mortgage is that they have to allow themselves a buffer. So they, you know, don't use up all your savings towards the purchase. Be really vigilant in making sure where you buy is the right place to buy, which has some growth or some opportunity for you to add some value. And, you know, I've just been in the studios for six months filming a, a course on renovation, the ultimate guide to renovation. And, you know, we've had beta testers go through this. And the number one thing that they came out of the course saying was they thought it was all about renovation and adding value and trying to minimize risk, as you would do with a 95% loan. But at the end, it's actually finding the right property. And a lot of people miss that, even homeowners. Mm. Yeah, great advice. Uh, many investment experts say that um, low income isn't necessarily a barrier to investing in property. Do you agree with that? 
Look, I, I definitely agree. I have quite a few clients that um, actually I've got someone I'm working with at the moment who has an under $40,000 household income but has over a million dollars worth of property, have $130,000 in, in rental income on top of that. Now, so, you know, they have been very strategic. They have bought well, you know, well over the years slowly when they could afford it. They have savings in place to look after the family as well. And, you know, you, you, I kind of take a lot of motivation from that. I had a very good income when I started investing and, you know, I have a, a very large portfolio now. But for those people who have a, a lower income, it is even more important that they get it right. They buy the right property, they have the right loan structure, but they actually know where they're trying to go and they have those safety buffers in place. And I think if they can, can think that way and plan ahead rather than rushing in, you're not going to have a disappointment. So is that the sort of advice you'd give to someone on a low income as to how they can win the banks over? What, what other tips would you give them? Yeah, well, look, there's a couple of things that are really important. And if you combine a low income with a 95% loan, you know, honestly, I'd have to say I'd probably see about 10% of those loans getting through. Um, so although the lenders are offering those, you really have to have the strength around yourself um, and your personal collateral. So, you know, keeping the asset aside from it. So we're looking at career co collateral. So for me, career collateral is around having, you know, um, being in your 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 actual current profession for a period of time. Now, obviously, low income earners may not have a you know, university qualified profession, or they may be self employed and, and you know getting their, their business up to the kind of earning potential they want it to be. But the really important thing is to you know look at what the lenders are looking at. They want to see some stability. So they want to see stability of savings. They want to see that you're stable in your lifestyle. You're not moving every six months. You know, two years in the same kind of a place where you live. Uh, two years in the same job. So they're looking for some stability, and they're making sure that you can actually afford the loan as well. So they're actually buffering, you know, one and a half to two percent on top of the current interest rates to give a bit of a tolerance test there. And anyone who's taking on a big loan, especially on a smaller income without a great net pot of savings to dip into, you really want to minimise your risk. So that's how you look better to the lender. The other thing is making sure you're buying the right asset. So nothing that's too risky, something that's you know um, able to be sold quickly or rented quickly if you get into trouble. So we're not talking about a one bedroom unit amongst 300 other one bedroom units in a large complex. We're talking about what the major demographic for an area actually wants. Of course, situations change, James, don't they? I mean, people borrow money, they get married, and then, of course, along come the children, and then it becomes down to, to one income. What, what would be your advice to, to folks in that situation? How can they make the most out of that you know, before they actually get into a family? Look, one of the things, your borrowing capacity is usually higher by yourself. So I know, you know, with myself and my husband, we bought our properties in our own names. Now, there's some land tax benefits there as well. But until you um, get to a point where you kind of lose your own personal serviceability, you don't need to borrow with another person. And then you would go and borrow with another person. I guess the thing that you need to be aware of, especially if you're going to have someone who's going to take some time out to have children, now predominantly that's the female. So, so when you're looking at buying your property, what you might think about is if it's a positively geared property, if you're going to have someone at home for five, ten years, then maybe the property held in their name who isn't earning an income could be the better opportunity. If you have a high earning income person, so let's say you know dad stays at home and mum goes to work because she earns a high income, you know, maybe best to have the property in her name because she has the higher income and it's a negatively geared property. So it really comes down to what your strategy is and that just brings us back to having an absolute nailing what your goals are, what your property investing strategy is that's going to allow you to get to those goals. Joan, I guess just to wrap up, how how can investors with a family best ensure that they minimise their mortgage risk? What would be your advice? Look, there's a couple of things, especially if um, you know, you've taken, you're an investor and you understand you know, the benefits of having interest-only loans. It's about having the right lending structure. So, for instance, um, for me, one of the things that I look at for my clients 
is that the interest only period is usually about five years. Now some lenders have interest only periods for 10 to 15 years. Now invariably when you start, you start with the, the banks that are going to lend you and the money that you need but also with the best benefits. So there's kind of a banking hierarchy. So we start right at the top at you know the major four big banks. Now their serviceability for most people is not that great. You know they they put on a two percent uh, loading for all of your existing debts and all of the new debts. As you go down the lending structure, there's actually more lenders that will take on existing debts at the current interest rate, so you can borrow more, or they might take two and a half percent of your credit card limit, not three percent. So. What I usually do is work my clients down the, the banking hierarchy, but one of the things is if you're planning to have a period of time where you're buying a number of properties and within that period of time, you know, your first bank's interest only period of five year come, years comes up and you can't reservice that uh, loan or when they go and do a reservicing and get another five years interest only, then you could get in trouble and they could provide you with some cash flow issues. So just thinking of things like, you know, which lenders have the largest interest, a longest interest only period, or which lenders have the interest only period that you can roll over easily just with a phone call if you keep your loan in good conduct. So that's one, just one thing. But I guess from, you know, looking big picture, there's so many ways that you can minimize your risk with lending. And it really is about sharing some of that exposure with different lenders as well. So I, I always speak to clients, they say, can you get me a really good discount? And you know, we can get over 1% discounts for clients with over you know, $750,000 in lending. But the reality is that lender may not be the right lender for you for your entire portfolio. And you know, I, I mean, I have eight properties, I have six lenders, you know, I spread my lending around, I'm, um, I have access to the different policies during the GFC when one lender has a more conservative policy, I can actually have a relationship with other lenders as well. So I think it's really important to, you know, work with, with someone who understands the complete structure and the behind the scenes of what happens with lenders. It definitely doesn't come down to interest rate. But you know, one way you can minimise risk is consider fixing some of your interest rates. You know, we're definitely seeing some long-term uh, rates. You know, the five-year rate indicating that it might start pushing up, even though we are expecting to have variable rates come down in the next 12 months. So you know, maybe looking long-term and saying, well, let's hedge some of this and put half of the loan on fixed or 100,000 on fixed, so that you know, just in case it does go up to seven and a half percent in five years' time. You know, I've secured a five and a half percent five year fix. So you can hedge and minimise your risk some some ways by fixing, by looking long term at the lending criteria or the features of the actual loan, and actually understanding what you want to do. So, for instance, if you want to renovate and access equity, well, you want to be with a bank that's going to allow you to put a, a line of credit or access equity easily. So, you know, there's a, a number of things that you can do to actually minimise your risk when looking at the right lender for you. It's been fab fabulous talking to you, Jane, as it always is. Thank you and some great advice there. Jane Slack-Smith, who is the Director of Investors' Choice. Uh, once again, Jane, thanks for your time. Okay, thanks, Kevin.